Thanks, um, Jonathan. Um, now it's my delight to introduce uh, Professor Fiona Wood. Um, and most of you in the audience would know uh, Fiona Wood as um, a consultant, um, burn surgeon, plastic surgeon, uh, both at um, uh, Fiona Stanley Hospital and here at um, CARS. Um, and she's also a professor at um, UWA. Um, and co-founder of the um, Fiona Wood Foundation. Um, so that's how most of us would know Fiona, but also um, she's very famous and uh, familiar to me as the co-inventor of Resell, which is this amazing spray-on skin, uh, which is really changing the lives of a lot of people, not just with burns, but also with other skin conditions. It's an amazing invention from Western Australia. Um, it's been, it's grown now into um, a company which is called called Avita Medical, which is now uh, worth more than a billion dollars. It's listed on NASDAQ and it's all due to uh, the amazing innovation of um, uh, Fiona Wood here. So what a wonderful treasure in innovation for West Australia we have before us. Um, in recognition of Fiona's work, she's received a number of uh, awards, including Western Australian Citizen of the Year in 2004 and Australian of the Year in 2005. And Fiona is also uh, an Australia living, Australian living treasure and a fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Science. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, you know, Vita Medical being worth a billion dollars, I have to say, is in no small part due to an enormous amount of human energy uh, by many, many people over a long period of time. And as I, uh, with her thinking about that and thinking of what Horatia had said about innovation, collaboration, and energy, I thought, right, set me up. This is where we're going. And uh, what I'd like to start with is to just put down a table with really where I started and where I guess uh, we all are is in a relatively uh, confined uh, health space. Looking at you know, clinical research to translate basic science into uh, clinical practice, and this is where I've been for th over 30 years now, and then pulling in population health data, which where else are the best in the world? Because I remember going to see Fiona Stanley uh, with a problem I had, and I said, yeah, I know you've got the answer. I know you can t sort this out for me. Where do I go? You know, so bringing these things together, underpinned by education and training, is where I started. But what I'd like to do this morning is to tell you a story about what's happened to me in 2020 and uh, how COVID has made me step outside of my uh, comfort zone and then come back to my more personal journey and how we've been able to drive that further forward. So we start with a relatively traditional uh, piece but then it was March. By March I'm feeling anxious. I could see what's happening. My mum was 90 on Sunday in the UK, and the party that uh, we were planning has certainly crumbled. It was crumbling and looking around the world. And I'd met a girl called Gemma Green, who was working for Can innovation uh, for Canning City Council. I'd met her in a le young leadership forum, and she'd snuck it stuck into my head because she's an amazing amount of energy, right? So it snagged. And she'd spoken to me about an I Think platform that's housed at the Public Sector Commission. And it struck me there was a whole lot of white noise going on, there was a lot of raised feelings and anxiety. Why don't we use the I Think platform to ask the community for their ideas? Around asking the community to help solve the problem, a health community, a general community, anybody you like. Well, that was an interesting comment. Because I knew Nick Gemma knew about this, so I rang her and uh, to cut a long story short. The Crowdis, the I Think platform, up until that period of time, was run by a great vibrant group in the Public Sector Commission, and it was internally facing. Any of you could have uh, connected with it as uh, public health employees. But the uh, Crowdicity, who owned the platform, very rapidly turned it facing the public with two million licenses, pro bono. So we've now got a platform and an opportunity for that platform to be launched by our illustrious leader, there's Roger Cook, say yes, this is how do we stay well? And let's put the challenges out to the public, but what do you do with those challenges? And that made, you know, made, made us nervous, right? Because we'd sort of said, oh yeah, this is a great idea. Ideas are 10 a penny. 
the sweat comes making them work, yes? And so this is where we uh, had the idea of setting up the WA Innovation Hub. It was a pop-up innovation engine. And so this was an advisory board, and you see we're, uh, Fiona and Gemma there with Chetina from RAC, and we linked in with uh, Kevin and Liz from uh, other innovation uh, entities, uh, hubs, other people from Western Power, people we knew who were in this innovation space. Oil and gas are notably absent because they were kind of busy. Uh, and so we were in this, uh, trying to sort ourselves out. And so we were in this place where well, these people came together and we came together every week. And we were able to then har harvest the ideas and move them forward. We moved them forward through a standard innovation gate stage process. And so we, uh, over the period of 12 weeks, we reviewed 149 ideas. And we can, uh, fed the information back to the Public Sector Commission. And the ideas went to us, to the WA uh, Innovation Hub. They went to uh, JETSI uh, uh, with innovation and science especially the ones around PPE. They also went to the Department of Communities. So we weren't the only ones here. We kind of got all the ones that were left over. Yeah. Where do these fit? Okay, well, we'll give them to that lock down the road. And so we then think, well, how are we going to actually track this and follow this? And then again, people were coming forward to help. I think, as I said, barriers were falling. And that's not the first time I've seen this in my life. It's almost 20 years post Bali. And it was a time, I remember Ian Gollo saying to me, three weeks post the Bali bombing, we've seen something extraordinary. We've seen people uniformly positive, helping people they've never met before and coming to the table with their energy. And I remember it changed my life, that comment. Because why do we have to wait for such a profound negative to get more positive? But I'll leave that to one side, we can debate that. But I've seen it again here this year. And so Visaggio is a, a, a company that have built a visualization platform, so we're tracking ideas. And this is now a game pro bono, going to be housed at the health department. So everyone in the innovation across all the HSPs can use this so we have visibility of what we're all doing and what we're all innovating in. And it's so we're just in that process of translating that into something real and tangible for our future. So this is at eight weeks, we had a few milestones. And at that point, we had 139. As I say, over the 12 weeks, we got to the 146. And so I'd like to share with you some of the ideas that we drove down and uh, that I think it's a little bit rude when I saw this, ideas worth exploring. I thought, well, they were all worth exploring because ideas are always valuable. And it's a question of how to, we connected a lot of people, a lot of phone calls going on, but these are the ideas that we kind of drove uh, first hand, for want of a better term. So, smart surface chemistry. I said, yeah, I know some smart surface chemists, says I. Let's get them all together. So we had a task force, and it came from Epichem. Epichem is a company down in uh, uh, Bentley, uh, do an amazing amount of things that we never know about, right? And so they put on the, the platform the, the uh, ideas around uh, hand wash. A smart chemistry. And I rang and I said, come on, we could do a lot smarter than that, can't we? And so we got them, uh, they were the, the sort of the nucleus around which we got the Chem Centre, University Chemistry, uh, infectious diseases teams and things like that. And so we started looking at, well, can we see something on the surface? Can we clean the surface? Can we change the surface? And that were those are three ch uh, challenges. Can we actually change a surface so that it is uh, cidal, bactericidal, virucidal? I just sent an email to Asha earlier this week. Somebody's still coming forward with a paint that sheds itself so that it's uh, antimicrobial. And it's antifungal in certain circumstances. Is it antiviral? We don't know. Do we, do we engage? We are, we're exploring that because some of these ideas have continued. And some have continued in the UVC space. The far UVC is ultraviolet light that can clean potentially without damaging humans. So can we have it on whilst we're operating? So we continually clean the environment. Now that's exciting. It's interesting. 
We don't know yet, and we've worked, that's a, a grant that's been going off left and right, but it's started, this hub started the energy in this space. This was one of my favourite ones. I got to uh, uh, take a whole group of year 12 students who are very naughtily not uh, distancing in that picture, uh, and I took them virtually into the operating room, an operating room set up for COVID, and an operating room that was as business as usual. And in that one hour, uh, we had an ex exchange of, uh, these are the problems, ask me question and answers, and that, video then was uploaded to the I Think platform in a secure area that was given, and access was given to high school students. 300 students and their teachers connected with that. They went through a six week innovation process and at John Curtin, we care, uh, high school, because by now, by the end of July, we could come together in, a, in a, a truncated form, 11 groups presented their work. Again, some of those ideas have been taken up and they're being pushed forward in a commercial sense. One of the most interesting ones was a young girl who was so shy uh, she couldn't speak directly to the audience, so she spoke from behind the curtain and had images and mock-ups of us all operating with thermal cameras and, spatial rec and facial recognition so you could see who was t had a temperature and everything in the environment. Yeah, it was and one of my things that I was really wanting. I want to be able to move someone on the operating table and access every part of the body because you know, no part of the body is, is immune from burn injury. But it's really hard to move people, especially down at Fiona Stanley. I like coming here to operate because it's really easy to lift a leg. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so I, the, the ideas of magnetic moving someone without touching them, amazing ideas that are still going. One of the things that really impressed me were the various people who came to the fore. And the Design Lab 90 was a, a Deloitte's platform, and they again, pro bono, said, we'll run an innovation uh, uh, sessions for you. It was oversubscribed within 24 hours, and from that, we got so many ideas. We were swimming in them. And th certain, some have snagged, some have got traction here and there, and some things have come back and come back. And a, a well indicator of our community is one that's snagged and come back. How do we understand what we're doing in the global sense? How do we understand that, in fact, from a sustainable health review, you'll see that I should have, that's tracked along the bottom here because that was one of the things that we were referring to and accountable to, uh, that if we want a sustainable health system, we have to understand wellness, we have to understand our communities. And I think we're increasingly um, uh, engaging in that space. But the wellness uh, and w index was one of the standouts for me in that uh, sessions, then series of sessions. We had people say, uh, approached us. We fly drones over crops and, and spray crops. Can we f spray disinfectant? Well, that's a really dodgy number, spray and disinfectant, because you don't want to be breathing it in. But in what I was on uh, with Alan Finkel on uh, the uh, advisory council nationally that was responding to questions from the government. And even though I was very much a fly on the wall, because this is not my area of expertise, uh, one of the uh, rapid papers I remember had an interesting reference to uh, red wine. And that red wine was as bacteria and virucidal as many of the quaternary ammonium compounds. Well, yeah, we could spray red wine. Uh, so we did. Uh, uh, over a, over park, uh, a park area outside. Can you add this as a, an augmented uh, system to the Optus Stadium or whatever? And that's been in negotiations since. But as things folded down and we didn't need to progress that, it was sort of sitting in abeyance. But I it was really fascinating and we got to fly drones and I had uh, I'd set up a beautiful experiment in the park with all petri dishes with litmus paper on to see that it was going and of course the, the drone went up and everything flew away <laughs> so hmm, great experiment uh, and so uh, well, we had one of the things that was absolutely fundamentally different for all of us was the amount of uh, teleconferencing, video conferencing that we had to do with our patients. 
On the uh, I Think Hub, it was a very strong message from our community. The I Think Hub went on to have more challenges that are in the, uh, were collected and put in the roadmap for recovery by the government, and almost a third of those recovery challenges were around e-health, telehealth, digital health. And these are things coming from our community. This is an area we have to engage. EY organised five workshops. 60% of the attendance in those workshops was consumers with people, uh, us uh, as well, you know, of all the clinicians and administrators of all different types. And all that work, an enormous amount of work, has gone to the health department because their outpatient reform strategy that was put on the table in December of 2019 was achieved by May of 2020. There's been a slick back but how do we maintain that momentum forward? And how do we actually enhance it? My uh, reimagining health was, I wanted 50 years time. What's it like in 50 years time? I got my wings clipped. There we go, 10 years time, five years time, no! What's it gonna be like when we have got inbuilt sensors, when we're in the matrix? But anyway, we kind of, you know, they brought me back down to earth, nailed my feet to the floor, and we did a sensible piece of work instead uh, that was useful to the health department. <laughs> Uh, one of the interesting things was the RAC vehicle was no longer going around South Perth, so uh, we had a lot of scoping uh, to take it down to Fiona Stanley to get people from the uh, train station and things like this. This was never eventuated because the, the traffic lights and again the need dissipated. Yeah, but it was an interesting uh, set of uh, experiments to see if they could uh, go from the automation that we have here and we have in Fiona Stanley taking you know, meals around and all the rest uh, to actually taking people or specimens. And so that's, as I say, on the back burner if we needed it in the future. So we have to think about this from my perspective. One of the take home messages from all of this for me was we have to be thinking about how we can be sustainable in Western Australia. We have to think about, do we plant rubber trees in the Ord? Because currently 99.9% .9 of all rubber trees in the world are in Malaysia. But there is an environment in Western Australia which go, spans the global environments from an agricultural perspective. Is there opportunities like that? Is it important for us to be sustainable? To a point, yes. What is the 40 or 50 things that we could run here with if we weren't so precious? No, I prefer my gloves to be green or blue or whatever, you know? What is the base minimum we could run here on? What is the minimum number of antibiotics, minimum number of analgesics we need? And then we need to be thinking about being sustainable in those, yeah? But West Australia's got a lot of energy. We've seen all these things. I've only skimmed the surface. You can imagine it was a, a pretty intense three months. And there's all this energy. Well, where do we sit on the global stage? And we're not the only people doing this kind of thing. You know, we are building, we were building all these companies that helped us. Many of them are global. When you look, there's things happening in the NHS that were on the same platform by the same uh, Crowdicity software group. And they actually asked, help us capture the beneficial changes across the NHS. Yeah? So we're not the only people in this space. The I Think platform is now turned internally, but we can use it. And it's coming to a space near you soon, because I know Richard and I will be getting onto that soon. And so, you know, we can harvest ideas, we can connect, and we can develop things in Western Australia that are useful for the rest of the world. We've got great precedent in oil and gas. I would suggest we've got great precedent in the research and the innovation that is done here in this building. There are many aspects of what is done in Western Australian health, that is influential across the world. I've been a great believer all my life in not sitting and waiting to use somebody else's technology, but getting up and driving the technology. So, how do we do this? How do we bring these ideas to life? That is a really interesting question, isn't it? And so, what I'd like to do, if this works, 
yes, it's working, is show you this video. What is innovation? Life is made up of dots. Many, in fact most people, believe that the dots they see every day are all the dots there are. So life goes along according to these known dots. Decisions and solutions are based on these commonly known dots, as well as many conclusions too. Some companies build their entire businesses on these known dots. This we know as the status quo, business as usual. Then one day, someone comes along and sees one or more dots beyond the commonly agreed upon dots. Dots that others missed, dots that are ignored, dots that others have long since forgotten about. Some like these new dots and celebrate this new discovery. Liking how things currently are and comfortable with everyday dots. Some protest these new dots. Some even claim they are invalid or worse, are imaginary dots that don't even exist. Yet, it's these new dots that potentially change everything. What is the source of these new dots? Notions. Unexpected connections. Ideas. Possibilities. And imagination. Fire was one of these dots. So was the wheel and the bicycle, and the automobile, and the computer, as well as the internet, the smartphone, and the tablet. In fact, many of today's common dots were at one time uncommon, newly introduced dots. So what is innovation? Those other dots, the ones others miss. And having the certainty to know that the dots you see are not only valid, but necessary if the world is to move forward. Oops. <laughs> I could get it on, but now I can't get it off. So I would put it to you that everyone here, everybody around us, is capable of seeing different colored dots. Yeah? But it's a lot easier to do it when you're doing it together and collaboratively. And so Jim and I got ourselves together and we said we wanted to give this feel that everybody had understood that they could stand up for safety, as we, we've all done. Can we stand up for excellence? And what is excellence? And I'm telling you that in my definition of excellence is deciding to be above average. If we continue to drive to the average, the average will go down and our quality will go down. It cannot do anything else. Average is not good enough. So we have to lift that average. We have to d decide that the gold standard, the average, isn't good enough so that we start looking for the dots. And then we start making innovation change that adds value. Because, yeah, I have ideas all the time. You can, yes, you've heard, you know, some of them are absolutely start raving bonkers. But what matters is finding those gems and allowing and giving people permission to find their dots, their ideas. And I think it's everybody's job. This is a, a picture I've, I took from one of the plastic registrar's talks because it was very appropriate at the time because nobody was picking up the dead rat. We all need to pick up the dead rat. We all need to get our hands dirty, roll the sleeves up and get on. If we all did a little bit extra, we'd all be going to the moon for our holidays. Probably no COVID there. Anyway, and if we all do a little bit less, we'll be stuck in the mire. And we'll be Western Australia will be the world's most remote city. Stodgy. I don't think that's true. So... Working together and collaboration is absolutely fundamental and key, and you've got to start by identifying the problem. So I'm going to indulge and show a little bit of my personal journey to show you it's real and it can happen. I met this kid in 1985, and I've carried his picture with me because one day that will not happen. 80% of our pediatric cases requiring surgical intervention, as of now, will have no visible scar. But that means 20% too. 
And so let's identify the problem and know your limitations, yeah? You've got to know your limitations because you've got to put it in context. Because there is no point in doing a whole lot of things if it doesn't fit our clinical translational paradigm. And so, all I want is a back to tank. Luke Skywalker there is come out like his skin is new. I want to regenerate. I want to understand the power of regeneration. I want to understand the power of skin cells to regenerate. And you've got to understand the literature. You've got to understand where you're playing and who's playing in it. And we've got to see what matters, what matters to people. And when I arrived here in 1987, I took a call from Kununurra. I was a registrar at Royal Perth and it was a major burn. And I stood to attention waiting for that burn patient to arrive. I finished the rest of the list of the day and I went out of the burns unit standing there. Right, it's for my first major test as a registrar in burns. And after a while, three cups of tea later, I go, should really go home maybe. Uh, when would you expect this patient to come? Dumb, I hadn't asked the question before, but anyway. Uh, tomorrow? What? Coming by camel, most probably, was the answer. So, well, what, are, what are we dealing with here? Every intervention from the time of injury will influence the scar worn for life. So, as soon as I transitioned to the head of department, like the burn service director in 20, 1991, we started educating, educating, educating everybody in the community. We give out Ben and Bella books, the superheroes of burns, because every intervention matters. And the other thing that is absolutely fundamental that every one of our patients will tell me is that the quality of that outcome must be worth the pain of survival. I'm paraphrasing it, but that is an absolute driver, yeah? So you put those two things together and it gives you the opportunity along the continuing clinical journey and knowing that what you're doing is for the right reason, yeah? Time to healing, fundamental time to healing. For every day that goes by, you have an increased risk of scarring. And so, Understanding how skin works, I could talk to you about skin until you all turn to dust. <laughs> it will be 2025 and we're still going, and we're still at the symposium. But it's a magical organ. It's a neural interface with the world, and it does an awful lot more than when I was at med school, because we know more about it. And when you breach that skin, things happen that we don't understand. And when you breach that skin with burn injury, you're more compromised than if you excise that skin, and I'll come back to that. I always put, uh, put this on the table, that when you've got your problem, and you've identified your problem, and then you think, oh well, the dots are there, that's the gold standard, game job done. No. In my life, Split thickness skin graft, a shave of skin from a donor site, usually on the thigh or the buttock, move to an area where you're wounded, is the gold standard. Not for me, the team here, the team at Fiona Stanley. The gold standard for us that we've is the normal skin of that, appropriate for that body site and, pay, and age of the patient. And because we're card carrying plastic surgeons, we could take 10 years off as a bonus. Yeah, so you know, you've got to understand that there are barriers to innovation. There are barriers to progress and they're called the status quo. And if you believe this is as good as it gets, and you think there's 30 more years of working life in you, ah, <gasps> gosh, gotta learn. Gotta learn from today to make tomorrow better. So in my space, understanding skin replacement criteria, this is the kind of injury we see very frequently here. It is our bread and butter. 60% of our paediatrics uh, admissions are scald injuries. This is a particularly nasty one. But this is a, a kitty that was from the early 1990s. We still see these children regularly today. Despite kettles not having the curly of inflexes on and all the rest, we still have an incident, accidents happen. So understanding what we need to do to replace this is important. And this is probably, you know, I say 15 years, it's probably it's really 30 years of my life in one slide. 
And I'll take a few moments to take you through it, because within this is an extraordinary amount of energy-driven collaboration to facilitate a solution that was initially ignored, discredited, and now is recognised as a technique that augments healing in the way that we put on the table in 1994. I started working with Marie Stoner in 1993. The skin sheet you see over my fingers there is a first sheet of skin that was grown for a West Australian patient. It was grown in Melbourne. It was 1990, I was a registrar at the time, and I've been following this research. I've been embedded in research because I was a female in a, in a surgery and I had to have a CV that got me into the interview. And therefore I've been embedded in research from a medical school when I was one of 12 women. And so I've been watching this. I knew the first time this has ever been used in the world was in 1982 in Boston, in Brigham and Women's Hospital, in a, a, co a collaboration between MIT and Harvard and uh, the health system there in Boston. And so I was driving along the road and I heard that John Padlandetsky and Prof. Just John Masterton from Melbourne had been to Boston, brought the technique back and they were growing skin in Melbourne. I went and asked the, Andrew Crocker, who was the consultant in charge of the case, can we, this, the patient in the hospital of five months dying with waves of infection coming over and skin grass falling off. And so, we, long story short, which, my, uh, which involved going to the administrator, the equivalent of a rest of Bill Beresford, and say, you don't know me, I don't actually work here. Uh, I'm a young doctor at work at Charlie's at the moment, but there's a patient, I think, whose life we can save in intensive care. If you get the money, you can do it, he says. I'm sure the governors and ethics, yeah, they've got ethics in Melbourne and everything. Okay, and so then I rang cold call to answer day lines. And I got through, I said, I'm Dr. Wood, Dr. Wood, Dr. Works sometimes. And I got all the way through to the CEO. So you don't know me, I'm a doctor at the hospital, but I just need you to, uh, you've got plenty of aeroplanes, and I'm, you don't have to do it yourself, if you've got pilots, do it, to take this specimen to Melbourne and bring it back. And they did, for 12 cases, actually. That patient healed, was rehabilitated on the burns unit seven months post injury with a, uh, when uh, suffered a cardiac arrest uh, from which we couldn't resuscitate. I, I was, at the time I'd rotated back into Royal Perth, I was there. And I had to then, my first job was to explain to the family what had happened. On post mortem there was a mycetoma, a fungal infection in the right heart because there'd been no skin for so long. But I had a, a choice to make. And I think, you know, wallow in self-pity because I put in an awful lot of energy, emotional energy, and uh, lent on a lot of people and twisted lots of arms to do this. Or to actually understand that whatever I felt was trivial compared to what the, the feelings of the patient's loved ones. And what could I give? I will never forget this, clearly I haven't. Because we will, what we have learned will change the lives of others. So I can tell you that the LD50, 50% 50 survival in Western Australia from burn injury is 80 to 85% body surface area. And that's including all other injuries associated with the burn, smoke or fractures or whatever, because those more complex burns tend to be complex. And that's in no small part because what we've learned and what we started in that day, that period of time, so by 1993, we had a telephone grant, and I'd, Marie Stoner uh, was a, a scientist working in the bone marrow laboratory in Royal Perth, and getting the bone marrows ready for the day as the skin was being flown from Melbourne, I was getting the lifting the sheets off, so you can see they're quite fragile, and we had to lift them off with enzymes and little pipettes and things. And I'd have well, my eldest boy would be sitting there and uh, love the liquid nitrogen coming out. He was a year one uh, when I was called to year one. He uh, uh, to see uh, this project. He and all his friends had built a skin incubator <laughs> out of cardboard boxes. It's very realistic. Uh, and so, uh, <clears throat> and I'd go back, take him breakfast, school, and I'd come back and operate. And so we'd we'd met, we'd worked out really talked a lot about how we could do it better because we were young and naive and can't we always do better and so we had a telethon grant and in February of 1993 we were able to grow self sheets in 10 days not 3 weeks 
And that was by knowing the literature, looking what everybody else did, and then making us our fast pieces as well. Very quickly, we realized that if the cells were immature, they we did better clinically. And so we started harvesting the cells before they became a sheet and putting them on as soup, soup and blisters. And we're not sure which one of us said it, but we thought we could just spray this stuff on. And the, the lab, which was in the old, uh, underneath the fire escape on Hay Street, that's where we used to live in the old uh, storeroom, that's where our lab was, uh, courtesy of Telethon. And so we ran down to Subiaco, uh, Jackson's uh, uh, art store, the pharmacy, and we got everything that sprayed. No spray throat, spray hair, spray uh, brushing, and we went to the anaesthetic trolley, rummage, 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 got everything that could spray in there, and then this nozzle is from an Italian mouth freshener. And the vortex and the aperture were searched with all our experiments that you maintain 90% plus viability coming through the system, and it activated colony forming activity. And it fit on a five mil syringe. You put it on a two mil syringe, you kill everything. But on a five mil syringe, it worked the dream. It's still been, that's what we use. We used it first in the end of 94. We still use it today. But now we don't have to buy the mouthwash as well. They just, <laughs> <laughs> we just buy the nozzles. Before long, we realized that our bigger patients, where we were growing skin cells in the lab for five days now, because we closed down that time to healing, because you could understand why I was so obsessed with time to healing. But if we took the, uh, the kit to the, uh, the, the tissue culture, to the body, to the patient's wound at sight, would we close down that five days? And actually, would it be better? Because the, what, if you prepare a wound properly, decontaminate, debride it, hemostasis, and it's, you have know, got to be meticulous uh, with the detail around the surgery, would that be a better tissue culture environment than a plastic uh, tissue culture flask? And the answer is clearly yes. So we put the first steps of the tissue culture environment into the uh, kit, we made the kit, and away we went. So this is a point of care medical device that uh, Paul spoke of. And that point of care medical device is a result of enormous amount of energy of people collaborating. Marie and I drew what we wanted on a piece of paper and took it to Welshpool where people were plastic moulding. The, the dyes that were made at that point in time are still used in Ventrex in California now. The enzyme preparation, Marie worked so hard to get the split. It, we basically, the skin is like a bread and butter sandwich. I want to split it and I want to get the butter off. That's the engine room of the skin. And so I wanted to split it in maximum 20 minutes. That was a really tall order. And so we managed to do that, I would know, lyophilize the, uh, the, pro, the, pro, the enzyme, and that's made by CSL. The electronics were done by Go Medical because we got to, to get the enzyme to the right temperature quick enough. We needed the batteries and the coil around the glass vial there, all the electronics. And then the, <coughs> the validations we had to do, we had to put the cells on all the contact, all the plastics, and do a whole lot. That is not something, I look at that and think, how did a young surgeon and a young scientist do that and build that? And that's what we, that's what we, it was the only difference between that one, the one we made, that our first prototype was, ours was blue, because I quite like blue. Yeah, Vita changed to grey, but anyway. And so, so it was really interesting. And the number of people that we connected with and the network we built to deliver that was extraordinary. And then the only place in the world where it could be sterilized and packaged compliant with TGA was Ventrex in California, where they still made. So I guess my point for laboring that is that when you, you know that you've got an idea, and despite, as I say, King's New Clothes claims for a long time, it got FDA approval courtesy of the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine and the military money in the U US, and such that now it's been uh, lifted to a new level and recognized as a very integral part of what we do as burn surgeons. And this is just an example of what we do, of the type of surgery. We salvage everything we can. We spray the cells over the surface as, as we would on a tissue culture flask. And as you can see, we see minimal scarring. 
in 80% of our kids. So driving these uh, ideas is something that I know is a lot easier to do when you, go, when you start building a team and you connect with people and you connect with uh, like minds and, and minds that are different as well. And so you need to think, okay, you've got original thought, but it takes a lot to drive it home and needs a lot of different skill sets. We talk about t uh, tissue regeneration still. We are very focused on the point of care, but we support and collaborate with people who are doing laboratory based because at one point we may be able to build vascularized tissue skin constructs for secondary microvascular uh, transfer. We talk, we work in tissue delivery. We have a 3D printer prototype that's been built for us, printing skin cells and the bioink to, to drive a more complete skin construct. But how do we actually get it, fix it? Do we automate this? And how do we drive the innovation and the vascularization in there? And when we get it into that place, everywhere around and underneath is a fibrotic scar response. How do we manipulate that fibrotic scar response to integrate it? And so there's lots of questions and lots of ideas around this. And as I say, this is uh, our first prototype of 3D printer printing the, the dermal construct as well as the cells directly onto uh, the wound. And all this has to be underpinned by data, 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 and understanding the impact of all your interventions along that continuum. What you're doing to someone up here, how does it influence them down, downstream? And so with respect to that, post Bali, we were given an opportunity to run a very rigorous outcome measure program uh, connected with our community, our Buzz patient community, uh, that's funded by lotteries. And that's fo formed a uh, fundamental base of our data collection going into the future and we've now got a very rich data sources on some thousands of patients but I'd come back to thinking about things we think about all those ideas out there but we can't forget the fundamentals and in every talk I, I give I have to talk about Burns first aid because I know that birds first aid will make a difference. And many of you have got children, no children. I've got grandkids now. I had my grandkid under the tap for 20 minutes not long ago, about three weekends ago, when he picked up the carrot cake in the tin with the air straight out of the oven. You know, it happens in a second. Yeah, and so clean, cool running water between 15 and 18 degrees for 20 minutes within the first three hours of injury will influence the scar worn for life. At this point, I've, I should have my asparagus and my thermos flasks as I do in the school. Where I put them, the asparagus in the hot water. You take it out of the hot water, you put one in the cold water, and it goes crisp and it's tasty. The one in the, that you just leave on the bench goes all floppy. You know, so it's the same principle. You know, we can actually dissipate that heat and that energy. And it's really good basic science done in Queensland and New South Wales that demonstrates changes in programmed cell death pathways. But this is data from some thousands of patients across Australia and New Zealand, those who had adequate first aid, those who didn't. It has a massive impact. So you all now are part of our Burns team. And that education has been fundamental along our, our path. But there's more questions. There's always more questions. We are, self we are a shape that self-organises to a rec and it remains recognisable through life. How? What are the drivers to that? Where are the drivers coming from to keep our shape? And when we have a scar, a burn scar, it's not the right shape. This is a piece of work done by a, a young man who's now in this, this is James Anderson, when he was a med student. He tested the sensation on a burns on an equivalent non burn site in context of how big the body surface area of the burn injury was. And the red and the blue dots are all paired because their nerve density in the burn and the non-burnt site. And you see they all stay together. But the implication is that as, as the burn gets bigger, the nerve density goes lower. And we couldn't get this published because no one believed us. Because what it's saying is if I'm burnt here, my nerves are changing here in the skin construct. 
I now know with other PhD students we change in the dorsal root ganglion nerve bodies, we change in, in an animal model before the burn injury and after the burn injury, everywhere across the back of the small rodent, the nerve density goes down. As such, we were able to get it published. And then another one of our PhD students, Tessa Garside, who's at ICU now, looked at transcranial magnetic stimulation to map the, the homunculus of the hand when they burnt, the hand was burnt. And it changes. Changes in its position and its threshold to stimulation. We're more recently using transcranial magnetic stimulation as a driver to plasticity in our elderly, such that they recover in a more expedient fashion. But doing this means that we've opened more questions. Where do we house the three-dimensional spatial information to drive a normal shape of our wound? And will at some point, be, will we be able to think ourselves whole? We use a mirror box. The OTs know all that, about that, where we put a bad hand in the box. There's a mirror on the outside. We move the good hand. The bad hand gets better quicker, reduces edema, reduces time to healing. But what's going on? We have PhDs now looking at the mechanism behind this. We also have people, we're collaborating with TKI and around the, the city, looking at the investigation between uh, the link between burn injury and cancer. And this came from here in 2003. A young boy who was eight years old when he had his 80% body surface area burned, back on outdoor ed camp, looking fantastic, only to die of a hepatocellular carcinoma three years later. Is that bad luck? Is it coincidence, or is there something here? As I said, the one place in the world that can answer that question, I felt, was Western Australia. So I'm left with this whole concept of being curious about this scar. It's abnormal, it's architecture, it's phenotype, and it's cell, it's chemistry. Is that tolerated by the host immune system? We have work working with peer, uh, uh, around the, um, the immune response to vaccination because it's different in our burn patients, but we don't know why. What about stress and cellular senescence? Is there a problem there? Because we know chronic stress burns is very inflammatory and leads to a really uh, increased inflammation response that appears to continue into a chronic disease. And for 30 years of my life, I've been focused on regeneration, not scar, trying to close down that scar. And eight, as I say, 80% of our kids don't have them, but they, they have a six-fold increase in mental health, incidence of mental health when they're burnt with, like, under the age of four, and most of them have no scar. So you've got, how can you not be curious about that? How can you not drive and try to understand and unpick that and figure out who can help you unpick that? And so yes, the data linkage was done here in WA because it's a strength here. And yes, having a burn injury has an impact for life, but the thing that absolutely blew us away and has been shattering across the whole international burns community is that 96% of these children and 84% of the adults were not major burns. And so this has changed the whole way of thinking and try to understand what is going on. We put things together, our clinical work with our population work, with our animal studies as I did in my original slide, and it takes us so far. But we know we've got a situation, this is the uh, children under 15 with a depressed kaplan meier curve, and we know it's real because we've added uh, with Aberdeen, and we've doubled our, our data with Aberdeen and interrogated it. But in a, ch a children's context, it's a third of that infection, a third of other injuries, and a third of malignancy. In adults, you see the similar depression, and, and then cardiovascular disease raises its head in that context with the malignancy and infection. So scar is more than skin deep. And so there are more questions to answer than whenever I started with that young boy. All I wanted to do was remove, the, make sure that we could heal someone without scarring. And now I understand it's more as on the inside as well as on the outside. And so we're looking for the needle in the haystack and how do we find this needle in the haystack? We've connected with IBM Watson Drug Discovery, the platform that's ingested, because the computer that won Jeopardy doesn't read, it ingests, 
I'm told, this is the right terminology. And so we were able to interrogate it and look for the, the identify the genes, uh, genes of interest and network maps, looking at the links between burns and cancer to try and hone down the size of the uh, haystack and boost the size of the needle. This is work that's just been uh, analysed last week from uh, the Australian Phenome Centre in a paediatric population demonstrating the difference in these cytokine clusterings post-burn injury with a normal control cohort from, I think this is from the RAIN cohort from Sue Prescott's team. And in the amino acid and tryptophan pathways, which were particularly interesting because of the neural aspects, you can see clearly differences. What does it mean? We don't know, but we're working on it. So we've gone from three bubbles to lots more bubbles. I couldn't actually, I'm very, not very good at PowerPoint, I couldn't get any more bubbles on there because there could have been, there could have been like, like a bubble machine. Uh, and the, it is really, what I want you to do is close your eyes at this point and think of a bubble machine. And then you'll see that you've got to think about who can help you in this and who can you link with to try and solve these problems that are around us all, all the time. And I've spent a lot of time in this space and I've seen some extraordinary work by lots of extraordinary people over time. And it's a hard road and sometimes it's, some days you get up and you think, oh, whew, it's going to be a big day, how am I going to do this? Well, I will leave this with you. Keep something of the best of you for those who care most for you. These are my six kids. I've been privileged to be the mother of such reprobates. But uh, it's a really important part of all this. We spend uh, so much of our lives giving so much to people we may never see again. Yeah? And that's not wrong by any means. Don't get me wrong at all. That's what we signed up for. But don't forget that on those days when it's hard to get out and get back at it, it's the people who care for you. You need to invest. You need to make sure you keep something of the best of you for them. And in acknowledgments, think of the bubble machine. Marie Stoner I worked with as an extraordinary scientist for 15 years before she retired. And Mark Fiat came from uh, Phylogica and took her place. And he's still a long-suffering Mark Fiat, according to my children. How does he put up with you? Uh, and, you know, that's... That's just two people in, in, in clinical, allied health, nursing, science, data analytics, data innovation, all, all the sort of engineering that, that we've been able to connect with, the, the science now that's possible in the TKI, in the Phenome Center, we have got just extraordinary machines. I was in the center down uh, the road with the eye knife, now the eye knife, I'll show, this is my last slide, I promise, but the eye knife is really exciting. It's a rapid evaporative mass spectrometry, and it's in trial in eight places in the world for cancer. So as you drive your diathermy or your laser knife through the tissue, it can rapidly anal analyze the chemistry of the cells you're going through, and it can tell you theoretically whether that is cancerous or not. When I saw this, I thought, pick me. I, w I would debride burn wounds day in, day out. 30 years later, it's the hardest thing for me to teach. It's got, you look at the feel, it's the colour, it's the texture, it's this, the way it bleeds, but how do you get that? But to, so we now have an eye knife in Harry Perkins South, and I signed my name on a Peruvian ground pair because they managed to get the funding for it for an agricultural reasons. <laughs> and so I've, I've, I've signed my name on it only so that they could say, yes, we can put our burns tissue through it. So we're now building the chemistry library of normal skin and burnt skin. And we'll hone down to, is this dead or alive? And if it's alive, will it be dead tomorrow? And if it's looking dodgy, will it be alive tomorrow? Because there is no substitute for your skin in that body side at that point in time. Whatever that we've done, all our fancy spray on and things, if I can salvage, that gives you the best quality outcome. And we link that with our systemic measures of the cytokines so we know that by the level of debridement is adequate for our systemic response. So that's where the science is at the moment in our 
in our sort of evolution. But I just wanted to speak to you about that personal journey because there are more opportunities for us all to drive forward than you can ever imagine. And so when you're thinking about this and you're going into a clinic, just close your eyes and think of the bubble machine and catch one of those bubbles and keep it for your own. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Fiona. What an amazing inspirational tour de force that was. Um, I guess we've got some time for a few questions yep. and I'd like to kick off just saying that um, one thing I remember when I used to um, work with you for the, all those years on that, that board, that you never took no for an answer, you always um, drove through obstacles. So my question for you is what barriers to innovation do you see in your crosshairs? Yeah, I think one of the, uh, the things that, we, uh, that is more complex now than was in the 1990s is the layers of governance. And I say that absolutely being a believer in governance. It keeps me safe as a clinician, as an inventor and as a patient. But I think what we've done is we've, we've, got, we've got so many layers on this onion because we're not good at, throwing, at taking things away. Somebody is a, behaves badly and we add another layer on. Someone over here does something that, oh, was, was that quite right? Well, maybe not. So we'll add another layer on. So I think at the time is, to, is appropriate to say, well, if we want to harness the energy of the human intellect that we have in our, in our systems, then we have to facilitate that with our governance systems. And that is no small matter. And it does need a very considered thought, as I say, because I'm a believer in these things, because I'm not a believer in just giving it, oh, let's have a go. I'm a believer in actually doing it in a framework that keeps us all safe. But I think that's uh, one of the areas. I think from another perspective, funding uh, is really hard. The, oh, I, can, I can sleep standing up. I get up in the morning and I'm flat out, funnily enough. I remember speaking with Arash at a panel down here in Stanley and said, yeah, I guess I'm a bullet again. Yeah? And I am, and I know that. And I get to the end of the day and I'm done. Yeah? I, I sleep before I uh, hit the pillow. But the one thing that's kept me awake over these years is how can I pay the guys? How can I pay them? Nothing else has kept me awake. And so that is a real challenge. And I think, again, our systems where we, we can look at collaboration and strengthening ourselves in an innovation context, where I'm trying to bring all our, our, our energy from the HSPs collectively, so we ask the health department one big chunk. If we all go scattergun, I don't think we'll be as successful. You know, so I think collaboration in that space is really important as well, to strengthen your ask and to make sure that it stands up to rigour because the funding is difficult. And the foundation, which was the McComb Foundation at the beginning, uh, because Harold McComb was an extraordinary man and a great mentor for me, has kept us alive. It's the people of Western Australia that's kept us alive through all the hard spots when there's no NH and MRC or there's no rain or there's no whatever. Right now we're fortunate we have of money in, in the coffers. But in those lean years, it's the corporates, the Woodside and Chevron, uh, Le Love and Legal people like that, but actually the people of WA who've always given. And if you think phone campaigns don't work, they do. And I, I urge you to listen to those guys when they're being. They do it for telephone, don't they? I think, yeah, and it's, yeah, we do small asks around a telephone campaign, and then we connect with people. And so people from a phone campaign have been connected with our foundation for years and helped us. So that's the funding and the governance. I could go on, but no. Sorry. Um, other questions? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, that's really inspiring. Um, I want to ask you a question about taking a product all the way through to commercialising it. And as a I don't think it would be as successful if it wasn't someone like you driving that along the way. But taking on board, you need, you need to have people to help drive those dots that you're not seeing. So how do you, and how did you, um, keep oversight but um, give away control, but still be the person that's driving it to make sure that your products yeah. 
I think there's lots in there. That's it. I, I absolutely fundamentally understood that unless I drove it, nobody else would. Yeah. Yep. Because of my baby, and, and I wanted this to go the distance. Well, Maria, Marina, I should say. And we wanted it to go the distance because we wanted it to be widely available and we wanted the, it to fund our research. And what I, I've, I was omiss, uh, remiss is in not saying is, in the early, in the mid-90s, Marie and I, when we, we assigned our intellectual property to the foundation, so all of the funds, the royalties have gone to the foundation, which has helped us as well uh, over the years much more in 2018 than ever before, I'd have to say. Uh, and so that was a given. But I had a lot of other things to do. I'm pro you know, if somebody asks me what my job is, I tell that the first thing that comes into my head is I am a surgeon. And so I had, uh, and we had lots of research going on all the way along the continuum. And so I had to have help. And I'd have to say, there were times when the help we had was not good. Do you say, Paul? I agree with that. I, I absolutely, very close to crash and burn, it took a whole lot with me. Because I believed people. And when somebody comes and, say, and does due diligence on what you're doing, my goodness me, please, if you forget everything I've said today, apart from the first aid and this, do due diligence on them. Because someone came to me and said, yeah, we'll give you all this money, all this, and it's not, oh yeah, okay, we check out you out. And I didn't do it. A million dollars later, we were facing bankruptcy. And we, Marie and I went to all the way down St. George's Terrace and said, this is our situation to these lawyers. Fold it and start again. Fold it and start again. Fold it and start again. Repeated, and then we found this guy, Paul Fletcher, and Solomon Brothers, he was, he was in his own firm now, and he says, fold and start again. I said, we can't. We, we, he said, you know, guys are not going to do that. He says, no. He said, right, I've always liked to challenge, and he's a, still a friend. So you keep asking and keep going. We were really back against the wall at that point. And that was about the time when we first met, as we were coming out of that, I met uh, Paul, and we were able to stabilize with uh, different entities around uh, this, the city that helped us because we were so naive. So when somebody says they're going to give you a million bucks, figure out how many strings are attached, yeah? And it sounds really stupid. But I was just like, Harold McComb said to me, he said, you know, Fiona, you just believe people. Someone comes to you and they say they've got pain in the right iliac fossa, you believe them. When they come to you and say they've got pain in the right iliac fossa only on a blue moon, you believe them. You just change diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and because I was bemoaned, I was like, I went and sort of wailed at him, you know, because I made, I made a big mistake. And it nearly cost us everything. But it was the tenacity of digging in. And when it gets hard, you can't go home. <laughs> you can't leave the table. You've got to find people that can help you. But that's, that, I think, is the big message. If it's worth it, you've got to keep driving. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I was just laughing because I was up and say I bear the scars of that time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. Great talk as always. Um, I want to go back to the eight-year-old case, um, Ben's case that had hep cellular carcinoma. Um, that's probably a rare opportunity, um, uh, as unfortunate as it is, a rare opportunity to connect dots where the kid had burns and then had cancer, but then you found the link with the immune dysregulation. Um, as a scientist myself, one of the things that I, um, I like to look at is the variation in the data, but the barrier, I guess, that we have in understanding what that data is telling us is um, not having a full picture of the patient. So we, we often look at you know, the condition and not necessarily the person. So what do you think is the, um, um, how do we move forward from how we currently do our research to looking at, um, you know, having a patient-centered research that we look at the whole individual and not just some cells or some minimal data that we've got. 
I think, thank you very much for that question. That's really insightful and interesting because when I, 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 I teach you about like burns to, from a clinical perspective, I say you look at the person and they look at the burn and they you hone in and think of what's the healing capacity of that burn and all the way down to that cellular level and then come back and put it in the context of that individual. You know, what is their weight? What's their nutritional status? Are they diabetic, cardiovascular disease? What other things are going on? You know, uh, and you know, what are the pathologies? That is the skin, what's condition of the skin? Is there, you know, is there scabies? Is there, and all this is all there. And that's what we do all the time, isn't it? As in, in that context. What I think now, we've got this capacity to actually look at all the different cells in that person, in the, in the blood, the hair, the urine, the microbiome and everything. And so we, we ha harness all this. We need to do it consistently over time. And then we need absolutely uh, to be in, lo in sort of in lockstep with data, our data analytics system biology guys, who can actually do the, the wizardry of the mathematics behind that, and then we're at the table as the subject matter experts to interpret. And I think we're moving certainly well and truly in that space at the moment. And I think it's getting increasingly complex but increasingly possible. I mean, the whole movement to try and get uh, you know, a, a consistent biobanks, consistent red cap data and people and all that will make a massive difference. It will take what West Australia was so renowned for in data linkage to a whole new, new level, I think, having taken it down to that sort of clinical data, the granularity of the clinical data with all the pharmacology and all the interventions along the, and then taking it down to all the biological specimens. I mean, that will give us an opportunity that will put West Australia in a whole different space globally and we, we will be able to give that knowledge globally. And I think, yeah, it's, it's exciting. I wish I had another 30 years. <laughs> Thank you. Just the last question there. Uh, uh, sorry, that was absolutely fantastic, Fiona. I, I just want people to reflect that uh, whilst Fiona was um, doing all that stuff on the spray-on and all those problems are happening, I had a flyer dropped um, in, in my letterbox that, that said, if, if your child is interested in a triathlon, uh, please come and join the triathlon <laughs> club. And it was Fiona's mobile number as the contact. <laughs> So, so, you know, hats off to you. You have an incredible amount of energy and, and, and wonderful that you have such a drive and, and looking after those people close to you. But just my you know, com comment more than anything else is that the great excitement we have within our Origins project that we are actually collecting information on those under five-year-olds with any trivial burn, um, however mild it may be, and uh, and we're certainly doing that data collection at the moment. But you know we'll have outcomes on their new development um, as well to to give you the answers that you connect some of those dots, maybe and not all, but some. But we'll also have the biological sampling as well, um, which will help. I think it's origins is fantastic you. because I I was mentioning that this morning on the ABC radio, <laughs> yeah, because for the first time, I mean. We clearly need to get out more days because first time we'll be our specimens before the burn injury. And there's no way anywhere in the world that has that. And that is just extraordinary to be able to look at that with that level of the granularity. So that's fantastic, thank you. So thanks very much. Um, how lucky are we having Fiona um, sort of helping to lead innovation here at CARS now. Um, what a wonderful um, inspiration for our younger innovators here on campus. So it's wonderful to work with you. Uh, in that area. So uh, please join me in thanking Fiona Wood for an amazing presentation.